the next presentation is from Emery, who is uh, quite regular at our local hackerspace and uh, uh, working on various topics related to Nix and NIM and such. And today uh, he will show us the uh, proposal for an encoding for robust immutable storage, as you can see behind me. Uh, and I'm particularly looking forward to this because uh, like immutable data structures and content address storage is uh, also a personal interest of mine and uh, uh, let's say a functional programmer's delight. So I'm yes, yes. Uh, quite interested in what you have to say. Welcome, Emery. Okay, thank you. Um, right. Um, so first I want to talk about the problems that Eris uh, can help solve. Then I want to talk about uh, what is content addressing? I'll explain Eris, the implementation, uh, cover some use cases, and then there's a few open questions that I wouldn't mention. <coughs> so the problem with data. Uh, first, if you look at how do we refer to data, um, you have to go back to the 1960s to um, Ted Nelson's project Xanadu, which was the precursor to our web. And this was the first hypertext project and set a lot of uh, the terminology we use for the web now. And in 1981, there was these 17 rules uh, published. And these were the requirements for Xanadu. <coughs> and 10 was every document is uniquely and securely identified. And 12 is every document can be rapidly searched, stored, and retrieved without user knowledge of where it is physically stored. And then in the early 90s, the web came along, and then the IETF defined uh, the URI. Um, URI is a compact stream of characters for identifying an abstract or physical resource. And then this was split into two uh, categories, the URL and the URN. And the URL uh, is a subset of URI that identifies the resource via representation of the primary access mechanism rather than identifying resource by name or some other attributes. So an example uh, here, you have um, the primary access mechanism. And then you have a server uh, DNS uh, name. And then you have whatever path uh, you follow on the server to get to your article. But URLs don't have to refer to anything in particular, like all the Wikipedia um, instances have, have this uh, random random URL. And more and more, you see these really ugly URLs. I mean, this was from like a privacy-related um, uh, mailing list. And they just have all this garbage and server state. They, they pack into URLs now. And the L in, in URL is for location, not link. For a long time, I thought it was link. And I, I put together these slides in the Netherlands. And I got that, uh, got this page. And in, uh, in Germany, it looks like this. And if you're in India, you can't visit uh, Pakistani sites. If you're in China, you can't visit a lot of other things. Um, yeah, and the other problem is uh, link rot, that uh, DNS records get more expensive over time. And there was a study this year on the New York Times. And they found, um, yeah, 25% of all deep links, which is a link not to one website, but to a page on a website, 25% of these were completely inaccessible. 6% uh, from 2018, 43% from 2008, and 72% from 1998. And half of all articles that contain deep links contain at least one rotted link. Um, and the thing is, once the link rots, then you can just buy the, the um, domain name. And so in July, um, there was a web hosting, a video hosting site called Vidme. I don't know when they went down, but uh, these news sites were embedding videos in their articles from Vidme. And a porn, a porn site bought the, uh, the domain name. And then so you had all this porn appearing in these articles. And of course, if you're reading this uh, Twitter garbage, you might as well watch some porn. So I'm sure they made money doing this. Um, but the, 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 the other URI category is the URN. Um, refers to a subset of URI that required to remain globally unique and persist even when the resource ceases to exist. So all these, um, all these standards have this, have this uh, URN format. Um, 
and books. Um, books have this, you have this international book number, and you can put this in your own form. And like a bank account's a good example because uh, if you close your bank account, the, the bank doesn't recycle your EBON. It, it's, it's persistent. Um, but uh, that's not really what Xanadu said what we would need. Um, but then we had Magnet, and Magnet did really um, concretely refer to very specific data. And this was like a, a de facto standard from 2002, and it's what is um, what we usually use for, for file sharing. So this is a BitTorrent magnet link, the typical BitTorrent link, and then this is for Direct Connect. So you can use the magnet link for different protocols. And this uh, Phantom Matrix example is a good example because the torrent was released in 2003, but their website went down in 2006. So the website lasted for three years, but this torrent has been active for 18 years. Um, yeah. And magnet links are usually content address, but not always. So then what is content address data? Data address by, not by location, but by the content of the data itself. And if you're referring to the content, if the content changes, you then have a different uh, address. So it's necessarily immutable data when you're talking about content address data. So uh, in the magnet link examples, in both of them, you have this sort of garbage uh, stuff in the middle. And this is a, a hash digest. Um, and these, these two protocols use two different hash functions, but um, they look similar. And this is probably a review for a lot of people, but uh, a hash function is a one-way function where for any input you feed in, you get a fixed length output. And the same input always results in the same output. And if you, looked on, if you look on the left-hand side, you change any bit of the input, you get a different output. And the output should be indistinguishable from random data. So you can't actually tell if the output is a hash or not or um, what the input data was. Again, uh, fixed output length for any input. But the thing is, if uh, one, one million bytes is a reasonable size for an image file, but 32 bytes is a reasonable size for a hash digest, so digests can't actually be unique because you have much more inputs than outputs. But if one byte is 8 bits, then 32 bits is 256 digits of binary, which is 2 to the 256 which is a relatively large number. But if you want to uh, exhaustively search to find mappings between the outputs and the inputs, uh, for, one, for one match, you have to only do 2 to the 128th on average. And the Bitcoin network does search for collisions at about 128 times 10 to the 18th power. But if you use the Bitcoin network to do this, it's still going to take you 10 trillion years. Uh, but the problem is um, that's not feasible because Bitcoin uses somewhere between 100 and 200 terawatt hours per year for um, hash collisions. And that's 100 terawatt hours is about 8.5 uh, megatons of crude oil. So um, you can't actually find collisions without uh, destroying the Earth. Anyway, um, so what are some existing content address systems? So back in the 2000s, we had a lot of uh, file sharing options. So Napster uses the MD5 hash function. Nutella was SHA-1. FastTrack uses this UU hash, and you might remember this as Kazaa or Morpheus. And then there are these Neomodus uh, Direct Connect, Advanced Direct Connect, and they use the Tiger Tree. But UU hash is interesting because uh, in 2001, computers were much slower, and hard drives were much noisier. And usually, you shared your computer with your family. So if your hard drive is constantly making this grinding noise, your parents are going to ask you, like, what's going on? This has to stop. So they had an optimization where you only hash the first 300k of a file with MD5. You hash the end with, well, you just run the end uh, through CRC32. And then every megabyte in between, you do another 300K of CRC32 and just store those together. Um, 
But the problem was that there were companies that were doing market research in the fast track network, and if something got popular, they would then download it and then corrupt the pieces that weren't being hashed and push it back out. And this was the end of fast track. Fast track was the most popular file sharing、uh, protocol in 2003, but eventually they say, yeah, half of it was garbage. So the important lesson is that you always have to hash、uh, an entire file, and because you cannot trust people. You really should be able to verify the file in pieces, not、um, all at once. So then, BitTorrent、uh, was a big improvement.、Um, it's still one of the most popular、uh, file sharing、uh, protocols. It's a very good network protocol, but、uh, it's good for transferring files, but not much else, unfortunately. And、uh, part of the problem is, well, BitTorrent was an improvement because. You would take all the data in the torrent, break it into pieces, and then hash each piece. Put the hashes in your BitTorrent info file, and then you have、uh, one hash to refer to the 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 info file. And then now, last year there was a new BitTorrent version released, and now every file in the torrent has its own tree of hashes, and this makes it easier to have files shared between different torrents.、Um, And also to to produce new torrents that update a set of files, whereas previously you would have to rehash the whole thing. This is much faster, and that's because now in the new torrent format, you take、uh, for every file, you break it up into fixed size pieces. You take a few of those pieces, hash that、uh, to create a, a level of a tree, and then you keep going up, hashing each、um, new hash until you only have one. And this is the root of the file. And then there's Git,、uh, was first released as the, the stupid content tracker. I don't know what Microsoft calls it now, but、uh, it was originally developed for、um, developing Linux. It's not totally original, but、um, it was the most successful successful of these kinds of、um, version control systems. And if you don't know what Git is, it allows people to work on a, a one code base simultaneously without、um, trampling on each other. And you do have some extensions for putting large files that are that are something other than source code into Git. Git is kind of peer to peer. You don't have to have a central host for anything.、Um, it's possible to copy files between machines this way, and it's definitely the most widely used source source code management tool. Unfortunately, it uses SHA-1, which is not、um, not the hash function of choice these days. And、uh, If you've ever used Git, you've seen these、uh, these sort of strings, and those those are、uh, hashes. So you may not realize it, but this is very much a content address system, and Git is proof that that this scales well.、Uh, Scuttlebutt is worth mentioning.、Uh, Scuttlebutt is a friend-to-friend、uh, social network.、Uh, there's no 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 servers. There's no centralization,、um, and you can. You can post public messages to whoever wants to read, and you can send private messages to other people. But you can also publish Git repositories through it, and this is the best tool I've seen for centralized、um, Git. And、uh, Scuttlebutt,、uh, well, Patchwork is like the the main Scuttlebutt client, and it looks like this. So you have some text, and you have an image, and anytime you see something like an image, this is done with like. A blob, and all the blobs are、uh, hashes. And、uh, when you see a message, you can see, okay, this message mentions blobs. I don't have this blob. You ask your friends. You tell your friends what blobs you want, and your friends tell their their friends what blobs they want and what their own friends want. And eventually, everything replicates、um, quite nicely. It's very robust, the way Scuttlebutt works. Uh, but the problem is that all these blobs are visible to、um, one or two degrees away from from the origin. So if you if you run Scutt, you, you can start Scuttlebutt, let it run for an hour or two, and then、um, you can just you can just you can just、uh, iterate over your blob cache and see what people have been posting have been posting for the last few years.、Um, you can encrypt the blobs, but this is not. Usually, how it's done because it's supposed to be a public、uh, social network, 
And unfortunately, the, the blobs are just hashed in a flat manner, like one hash per file. Yeah. Then there's IPFS, which is fairly well known. And IPFS defines uh, protocols for how you would store things, how you would encode things. If you have large files, you break this into blocks. Um, you can put these files into a Unix-like file system. And they have mutable references using public-private keys. And IPFS does uh, define a network protocol for synchronizing data. And you can use it to host websites, which is sort of the killer feature of IPFS. And it, you can see in this URL, this is a URL, but you do have the uh, content uh, address hash. But I don't like IPFS so much because there's a variable block size, and they define multiple hash functions for referring to blocks. OK, ten, like they define 10 officially, but I think you can use two or three maybe to, to um, within the system. So uh, what would, in my, in my mind, what is an ideal standard for encoding content address data? You should have a common uh, hash function. Uh, you want to be encoding data in a way that you can share it between applications and using different protocols. And you want your encoding standard not to be biased towards any one method of transport. But it should be also privacy respecting somehow. So then there's ERIS. Uh, and the simplest explanation of ERIS is an encoding of arbitrary content into a set of uniformly sized encrypted and content address blocks as well as a short identifier. And we use the URN format. And so an ERIS URN looks like this. And ERIS came out of GNU-NET. Uh, Christian Grothoff wrote a paper on ECRS, which describes um, what would become ERIS. And Puka Mustard wrote the ERIS standard. He did this for Open Ngadina, which is a yeah, local knowledge platform uh, for use in the S Swiss Alps. And then I started working on ERIS because of Dream, the Dream project, which was about building collaboration tools using CRDTs, and the CRDTs would be transmitted through ERIS. So what is ERIS um, specifically? So ERIS is built with two cryptographic primitives. One is the Salsa. 20 stream cipher, and the other is Blake 2B. And Blake 2B is inspired in part by Salsa 20, so they're, they're closely related and both quite fast. And we already have a number of implementations in relatively high, langu high level languages. So then, what is, what is ERIS actually? So, if you want to encode da data in ERIS, you first break it up into fixed size pieces. You take your final piece or block, you take the, you append a byte with the highest bit set to one, and then the rest is zeros. And then for each block, you hash it with Blake 2B, and now you have a key. You can optionally salt the hash function, but I'll, I'll explain that later. So for each of these blocks, you have a hash, and you treat this hash as a key. You key a cha cha 20 stream with the hash. You then XOR, XOR the plain text block with the key stream, and now you have a ciphertext block. And then you hash the ciphertext or the encrypted block, and now you have a reference to the block. And then if the data doesn't fit into one block, then you construct a Merkle tree of hashes with the key and reference pairs. Yeah, concat those all together. Um, and then when you get to the end, you just pad out these blocks with zero. And then hash and encrypt the, the tree blocks and keep reducing them until you only have uh, one pair, a root pair. And so, like, um, oops. yeah, so the bottom you have the blocks, the file. Each of those blocks has a reference and key. Um, that forms one level of the tree, and you keep. Uh, iteratively reducing the tree until you have one node at the top. So uh, when the blocks are in encrypted form, you only need a 32-byte uh, reference. This is the hash of the encrypted block. 
And then if you want to actually access the data, this is done with a 68-byte identifier. One byte is the block size, and the second byte is the tree depth. And then after that, you have a uh, root reference, which is the root block, uh, the hash of the encrypted form of the root block, which then you can request from storage. And then you have the key, which is the inside after it's been decrypted. So once you have the key, you can decrypt the encrypted block and then verify the contents of the encrypted block. And when it's encoded, it looks like this. We use base32. It's ugly, but it's not actually bigger than these stupid links you get in your emails these days. So there's only two choices of block size. The first size is one, uh, 1K. So because of padding, in one block, you can store up to 1K minus one bytes, because the one byte has to be for padding. And if you want to go past that, the trees will be 16 arity. So you can refer to 16 blocks in one block because 64 goes into 1K 16 times. So then, on the one level tree, you can store up to 16K minus one. And this is intended for metadata like RDF, um, short pieces of data. And then, with a, with a block size like that, you can put multiple blocks in one packet, one IP packet. The other block size is 32K, so 32K minus one in one block. And then the arity of those trees is 512. So you can fit two to the ninth block pairs uh, in one tree block, which is 16 megabytes minus one for a one level tree. And this is intended for bulk data, for large pieces of data. And 32K still fits in a 16-bit integer. So in theory, you could put one block into an IP packet if you have jumbo frames enabled and you're sure they're enabled and so on. Um, so to, to measure the overhead, I took one of these libgen uh, zip files with 1,000 uh, PDFs inside of it. And the one I looked at was 1.7 gigabytes. And to encode this into 1K... 1K blocks, this was 61 megabytes of metadata, of ARIS only metadata. But with 32K, it's only three megabytes. Uh, then I unzipped the zip and re, um, repacked it into an AeroFS image. And AeroFS is what Huawei uses for their system partitions on their phones. It's like a SquashFS replacement, more or less. The, this image was 16K larger than the zip file, but the encoded ARIS form was smaller by four megabytes. So if I had three megabytes before and now have four megabytes less, then it's about six megabytes of deduplication inside the blocks. So how is this possible that zip and ARIS didn't find these these uh, deduplication? Well, it's I mean 1.7 is a lot of space. But, but why, why, would it, why would it be smaller than the zip? So with SquashFS, usually your SquashFS squash image runs in memory. Um, but if you write it to a block device and you have 4K, like if you can imagine every 4K block in the SquashFS is compressed to 3K, then on average, you're going to have to read two physical blocks to get one logical block inside the SquashFS. So what AeroFS does is it compresses until it reaches the smallest possible size for um, a physical block and then stops and then um, clears the compressor and then starts again. So if you do this, if you align the compressed blocks, then you reduce the read amplification on the physical layer but also, if you do this, then you can, you can easily deduplicate blocks, which wouldn't happen in a zip or a squash of us. So anyway, back to what about privacy and security? Um, so you can see that it's easy to store the data and transport the data as it's encrypted. Um, but the problem is that it's convert, well, it's convergent encryption, so the same data will always encrypt the same way. 
So you have the problem of a confirmation of file attack, where if you can imagine, um, I'm in a conspiracy and I have four other conspirators and each of them I send a PDF, uh, but each one is different. I know that if they encrypt this, and it, I know that if they publish this PDF through Eris, then I know what the hashes of each PDF will be, and then I can monitor the network and see, like, uh, has, this, has, this file been, has this file appeared, and I can know who exactly sent it. Um, or if I seize some hard drive, I can, and I know what the hashes of the encrypted form would be, then I can check for, for the presence of that. And then slightly less serious is the learn the remaining information attack. So if you can imagine, I have like surveys that are ERIS encoded, and if there's only a millions or a few billion variations on what the survey could be, I could just generate all those and then check for the presence of those in a ERIS data set. But we can salt the inner hash function with a 32-byte key. So the so the, the outer hash function stays the same, but the inner hash function, you have to have this 32-bit key to then produce the correct key to encrypt or decrypt the block. And if you think about it, you could, you could serve files using different keys if you encode the data, keep the block references, and then can correlate those different block references with file offsets with some sort of lookup cache. Anyway, but the important thing is that you don't have to trust your storage now because you can verify everything that comes off of it. And this is good if you, have, if you want to create like stateless storage where you have read-only storage or write one, well, yeah, read-only storage. So what are the disadvantages of using Eris? We don't have any replication mechanisms defined, and we see that as a bit out of scope. We, we want to explore that, but that's something for a different spec. You could use Bloom filters. So you could, you could send someone a Bloom filter and say, send me any block that matches um, this filter. You could just send a list of hashes of what you want. I think IPFS uses lists like this. But you can also put Eris data into IPFS and use IPFS to replicate stuff. Now, we don't have any, any mechanism of correlating content to data or content to Eris URNs. So if, yeah, that, that course is complicated. We want to do that also, but this is a different, uh, different story. If you lose the URN to some data, you're not going to be able to recover it again. That's a potential problem. And there's no sort of permanent storage format defined if you want to write errors directly to a block device. I think I'll look at Venti, see what Venti does from Plan 9 and maybe reuse some of that. And uh, you're going to maybe want to garbage collect data, and that's not something that we've uh, worked through yet. So what are some use cases? So Puka Mustard, who wrote the spec, he's interested in RDF, and he says most existing RDF content is location address. The URIs are pointers to hosts that hold the content. If the host goes down, the content is no longer available. This happens frequently enough to seriously undermine the robustness of RDF. So this is this is an example from, sorry, this is an example from the W3, uh, and. This is a graph saying there's Dr. Eric Miller. He has an email address. But you can see inside of this, they have all these um, URLs. And there isn't, there isn't a guarantee that wc3.org is, is reachable or will persist. Uh, something I'm working on uh, with a group uh, in Bengaluru called Janistu is Papad. And uh, yeah. The audiovisual publishing platform for low literates without barriers of knowing to read and write. So this is a system for um, storing oral knowledge and then annotating and making correlations between these recordings. So you can see you would create a recording and then at different points of recording you can add an annotation and add tags, add images. 
so that if you weren't really able to read, but you can navigate using images, then you have access to this, um, this knowledge. And we want this to work uh, offline, so it would be nice to have some content address system that can replicate uh, content uh, in a mesh. Uh, I've looked into using Eris as like an intrinsic feature of operating systems. And I looked specifically at uh, dynamic linking and dynamic uh, loading. So I had the problem that I want to make an operating system where you can start programs without having a file system. But I was using Nix to build these programs. And uh, you can do this on the Gnode uh, OS framework, which is a uh, microkernel OS developed in, uh, on the other side of the river here. And uh, it works if you just widen some, some fields in, the, in uh, the base library and, and here and there tweak a few things. And so it's not, you don't really have to go into the, the dynamic loader and make it understand errors. You just have to make it simple enough that it will go out to a backend that does understand errors. And uh, this, is, this is nice to experiment, but it's never going to happen for glibc because it's too complicated and just don't go there. Like, stuff is going to break. People are going to be angry. So uh, quickly, if this, this really does work in Nix because you just have to define a hook that then you can inject into your packages that once the package is built, you go into the elf header and you can patch uh, these uh, file paths to point to errors urns. So go into the header, collect all the dependencies that are listed in the elf header, make sure there's no cycles, uh, I'll replace those in the binary, and then you'll want to write a file that says the final uh, errors urn, and then all the mappings between the urns in the binary to the, the file system of the build machine. And then when you want to build the actual runtime system, then you collect all these dependencies so you have a complete closure. And the dependencies can be stored in, in their like encrypted Eris form, or you can just use Eris as uh, a key that you then look up the binaries in. But if you think about it, you're no longer really dynamically linking things because the link is absolute, not dynamic. So you're really just deferring linking. Um, which then, like, well, then what, then what is the future of package management? And then how would errors fit into this? Or what are the optimizations here? Of course, you can do nothing and just use Debian forever. Like, yeah. um, <clears throat> but one proposal is called all VM, where you take all the packages in your system, uh, you compile them to the LLVM virtual instruction set rather than your native instruction set. You create one binary for everything. And the binary is multi-call. So if the binary is called with arg0 set to different uh, names, then you, then you select the behavior. Right? So make these giant binaries. And then you have a bootstrap system that starts a JIT compiler. And uh, you just JIT everything. Um, yeah, and if you're using Eris, you would then just take this mega binary and try and align everything on 32K so you can hopefully deduplicate between different releases. Less, less radical, more conservative is Distri, where all the packages are SquashFS images. And each package um, distributed in SquashFS form uh, contains all the dependencies of the package. And then uh, when you install a package, you fetch the SquashFS image, and you uh, mount it at some uh, path in the file system. And if you, were, if you wanted to then trans, like, store these packages in, er, in Eris, then you would want to use ArrowFS instead of zip, or instead of squashFS, and then make sure you align the blocks. Well, actually, ArrowFS, without any, without any tweaks, does work pretty well, but that's what you would do. Uh, so I do, I, I'll do some demos. Uh, the first is how you would use Eris just to produce checksums. Uh, file encryption, and then I'll show a file locker uh, example. Uh, yeah, so I have a utility called Eris Sum, 
And if, like, I'll just take some of these libgen um, PDFs. Yeah, so this uh, acts like uh, SHA-256 sum, MD5 sum, B2 sum, but um, I don't discriminate, so it also does the BSD uh, output format. Um, yeah, so it, you can also use it for file encryption. So there's a utility, Eris encode. Uh, you give it a file that you're going to put blocks into. And I can say, hello, Tottenspoon. And encoded, I get this URN. And if I have the URN, then I can decode the message. But um, if you need plausible deniability, you can then pack in other messages into the into the block file. Okay, um, and then the upload. Uh, so here I have a, a chat bot, a talks uh, bot, running here, and if I send it a file, oh. No, that's too big. I upload the file. It will encode it to its own database of Eris data. It should give me a URN back. And then it has, a, it has an integrated HTTP server and um, when I make a request to the HTTP server, it can then decode the content. But if I don't log um, at the bot and I don't log the HTTP request, then it's sort of a zero knowledge uh, uh, file hosting service, which is uh, relatively trivial to, to, to implement. So then open questions. I think it's worth questioning if something like this makes it harder or easier for archaeologists in the future. Um, if everything's encrypted, of course, it's a problem. We could potentially lose a lot of information this way. But on the other hand, if, if everything's content address, then we may be able to put things back together. I don't know. I think it's something worth thinking about. Um, there is a legal problem that now the the EU has really got this uh, obsession with uh, child pornography, and they want to make it mandatory for um, what is it number independent uh, messaging services to scan for child porn. I think like there's there's a loophole now that you can do this without violating the privacy regulations, but they may make this mandatory. And as I showed in this uh, upload example, this could be a problem in that case. And I think there's another problem that um, we don't like censorship now. Well, we say we don't like it, but I think we kind of like it, and we may go to our, go go in a direction where um, censorship resistant software is not as popular. But we'll we'll see. Anyway, we have a mailing list for the standard, which isn't finalized yet, but I think it will be soon. Uh, the code I've written is on SourceHut, and I'm on IRC as Emory if you have any questions. So, but yeah, that's it. Thank you, Emory. We have some time for questions, and we also now have the hall microphone, which can move around. So if you have any questions, just uh, give us a signal. I was, uh, myself, I was thinking of questions uh, during the talk, and I think most of them have been answered when you moved into this use case stuff. I've, okay. I've, been, I've grown a bit more paranoid now. 
<laughs> You're paranoid, more paranoid now. Like, like this scenario, like what you said, uh, uh, to give uh, specifically crafted files to each uh, co-conspirator and then see who uploads it, uh, yeah. uh, this stuff. Uh, that's, that's an angle I hadn't considered, so that was quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, regarding the legality uh, that you touched on at the last point, I mean, uh, if, if they may really make it illegal to do this, then we just uh, put all these uh, data that we want to store in some steganographic images, and uh, I mean, yeah. we, life will find a way. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting also because um, the, like, uh, some EU court threw out some, 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 um, they said you couldn't retain data indefinitely because you have an obligation to keep your keep people's data private. Um, so yeah, I think, I think this, this scanning for child pornography, it will be ultimately illegal, but of course it's legal until the court says it's not legal. So you, you, you always have this gap between um, which interpretation is valid. So. We have a question up there. Yeah. Um, Maybe I missed the point a little bit, but I'm not sure. Um, you said about something like censorship. There is no way to yeah, accomplish censorship using this method. Yeah. As far as I understood, it's just some kind of a reference pointer to some file yes. in certain terms. And why is there no censorships available? Because if uh, using this pointer, I can't reach the content, there could be censorship as well, couldn't it? Yes, it, it would be. Um, but I, so I, I mentioned censorship because if you are passing these URNs that reference data in, in an encrypted channel, then the data itself is safe, so long as the, the data isn't known outside uh, your communications. Um, but it's harder to then censor, censor the data because it's content address, so it's location independent. So, I mean, we want to develop this for sneaker nets and stuff like this, so in that case, I think you, you're, you have robust uh, protection against censorship. I'd have two, two requirements, which would be deniability for the host and billability, so I can charge for it. Deniability, I think, is difficult. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you can, you can uh, salt the encoding, so it's harder to, to, to see what you might have stored. Um, but deniability is hard. I mean, especially if we don't, if like it's right, if it's uh, read and if it's write once, read many, and there's no garbage collection, then you can't remove things. Um, but charging things, I think you could do this. Like, I mean, yeah, if, if you had like a, the, the data locker scenario where you're just storing people, data for people, then you can just charge on, um, just on terms of uh, how, many, how many bytes they're requesting, or how many bytes they're, they're pulling from you. Just that point needs to be trustless. So they, I need to prove that I really stored it for a certain time, and oh. they, of course, pay for that. They want me to prove that I really stored it. Yeah, that, that's something I haven't really thought about, proof of storage. Um, yeah, that, that I don't know much about. Uh, you'd have to look and see what other people are doing for that. <laughs>